Um, all right, so Committee of the Whole, the 28th of January. I'll call the meeting to order. Uh, record of attendance, Lindsay, you have that. No absent with regrets, everyone's here. Uh, any declarations of conflict of interest? And you can certainly declare at the time of the agenda item. Okay. Uh, approval of agenda. Any additions or deletions? So I have a, an addition 10A, uh, dangerous and unsightly. And I think Heather's going to speak to Councillor Hatfield's going to speak to that one. Any more additions or deletions? I think I was going to remove uh, TIR 8, 8B can come off because we know TIR is coming in um, in February to have a visit. <clears throat> Anything else that can come off or on? Okay, a motion with the addition and the deletion, please. Councillor McLeod, second by Deputy Mayor. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Contrary? Motion carried. Thank you. So we have a presentation by iSANS. Are they on? Okay. So um, is it Kathleen? Okay. So it's Kathleen Dontremont Mooney. I don't know how this works. Okay. All right, so Kathleen, you can, you can start your presentation. All of council is here, and I think the time allotted was 10 minutes, and um, we don't make decisions uh, on anything. I think this is just a presentation for information, but you go ahead, and thank you for taking the time for us today. Kathleen, can you hear us? Actually, is it Carla? No, it's Kathleen. Oh, she's right there. Yeah, she's on the right, upper right. Can you try to speak, Kathleen? Carla, you want to try speaking again? We spoke earlier. Yeah, Carla's here. She's just asking, yeah, she said, are you guys not hearing me? What was that? Say again, sorry. Can you guys hear me, Carla? Yeah, we, we can Hello. hear you. Yeah, Kathleen was just asking, are you not hearing me? she's asking if there's something she should be doing. I can always get started. Yeah, sure. Go ahead. Okay. So my name is Carla LeBlanc, and I work for an organization called ISANS, which is Immigration Services Association of Nova Scotia. So our vision is a community where we can all belong and grow. Our mission is helping immigrants build a future here in Nova Scotia. So who are we? Staff who is dedicated, diverse, highly professional, qualified, and experienced in the field. We have been serving immigrants for 40 years. We connect immigrants with employers and the community. We also have 300 plus qualified staff that work here at ISAN. We have 64 counties of staff origin and 70 languages spoken by, by the staff. So we're pretty well diverse. So as an onboarder employer engager, which is my role, I act as a liaison between employers and ISIM's employ, employment support program. So I'm here to help promote the benefits of hiring immigrants to strengthen and diverse their workforce. So what are the benefits of hiring immigrants? Well, they often speak several languages. They're willing to learn, listen, and share. 
They're flexible and innovative and willing to adapt to changes, changing environments and circumstances. So as an employer engagement or an employer onboarder employer engager, we offer um, services from two employers. Um, so we do offer a service called Skills Match. It's an e-recruitment tool. And this provides access to qualified pre-screened job ready candidates. It offers opportunities to post jobs and search the database for possible matches. So that helps with kind of the recruitment piece. We also do on-site recruitment and information sessions. We meet where employers can meet with suitable immigrant candidates here through ISAN, and often these sessions end with a face-to-face -face interview. We also offer a workplace culture. Now this program helps employers better understand the benefits of hiring international talent, and it also improves intercultural competencies and retain immigrants. So this service, this program can help with the onboarding piece for employers. We also have a professional mentorship program, which matches immigrants with mentors in similar professions or in the same profession. We also offer English in the Workplace, which is a free 12 week training program for immigrant employers to help with on the job language skills. So a lot of this training can be done in person, at the workplace, or even by distance. We also offer what's called a professional practice program. So this is this connects employers um, to skilled immigrant professionals through a wage subsidy program. So this is up to six weeks. It's part-time or full-time depending on the need. And there is no strings attached for this program. So there's no obligation to hire and can be terminated. Um, yeah, terminated by any party. So if the employer is feeling that the individual is not working out and the individual feels like he or she may not be a good fit for the company, then the professional program can be terminated at any time. So as an onboarder employer engager, so I'm here to help employers recruit, retain, onboard, newcomers, newcomers, <laughs> Sorry. Okay, so we have staff right across the province. So my area is, I serve the western area. So from Bigby County all the way to, to Shelburne County. And then we have, I have four other colleagues that serve right up until Guyfor County. So those are just a few services that we offer through ISAN. So now I'll pass it to Dolores. Hello everyone, can you hear me? Sure can. Okay. Good evening, everyone. My name is Dolores Atwood. I am the Wiry Settlement Staff for Yamot, Publico, Barrington, Shelburne, through to the Lockport and surrounding area. We do have other Wiry Settlement uh, Staff working across the, the province in the rural areas. The Wiry Program provides information, orientation, settlement support to immigrants, refugees, and their families who are new to communities outside of HRN. Wiry Settlement Services also include the Atlantic Pilot Program, which are temp uh, temporary foreign workers, permanent residents, skilled workers, and so on. The Wiry Program has been a great community resource for our diverse community of Yamut and surrounding areas. Our diversity in Yamut makes us unique. I also work with newcomers' families to assess needs and goals. I refer newcomers to community events, partners in our country, in our communities, and outside our community when necess necessary. I help newcomers navigate the system, organize multiple Irish programs. Irish settlement programs also include connecting clients directly to settlement necessities and resources. Banks, grocery stores, library, housing, employment centers. We also link children to other school programs and activities. Also connecting families to local parenting programs, referrals to specialized settlement, language and labor standard and employment services. We also help clients navigate the health care system working with schools to support uh, successful school settlements, 
delivering awareness, raising presentations about immigration, settlement, diversity, and inclusion. We also provide English language to newcomers and their families. What we do and what we know. Newcomers will be more likely to stay in a location if they are successful economically and are meaningfully engaged in all aspects of our community. Why do we do it? Immigration is part of the solution to building a stronger Nova Scotia. A long-term priority outcome of the provincial government immigration settlement funding programs is the successful retention and integration of immigration in Nova Scotia. Our right wish program begins uh, eight years ago, and uh, we have been having a very positive re uh, report of us able to retain newcomers in our communities. Thank you so much for this opportunity to, to speak to you about our Wireless program. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Dolores. You're most welcome. Okay, are we good? Uh, yeah, can you guys hear me now? We can. Hey, oh, okay, great. All right, sorry about that. Um, okay, so as I was, uh, I, I guess I was muted when I was saying this, but I am with the Western Wren, and uh, this is Kathleen Mooney. I'm with the Western Wren. My, my project is called the Atlantic Immigration Pilot Program. Mm -hmm. uh, I also help employers with other immigration programs, but in a nutshell, I visit employers who have a need for people and they can't find enough people locally and they want to look at the possibility of hiring foreign workers and I'm the person on the ground who can help them choose which program might be the best for them. Some of them are for full-time permanent. They're meant for people who want to move to Canada and eventually ap apply for permanent residency and remain here. Whereas there's another one that you may be more familiar with, which is the temporary foreign worker program. Most of the people who work in fish plants are temporary. They come and go and come and go. And then maybe one of these years, they actually end up applying for permanent residency after several years of going back and forth. So I'm able to make the link to the proper people at the provincial and federal level for them to learn all the details if they have questions about their particular situation. And I basically uh, help them with the application process and all the details and help guide the candidates that they hire uh, to ensure that they have provided all the necessary pieces of information and documentation to apply. So I work um, in three counties, Yarmouth, Digby, Shelburne. I travel to the, uh, the uh, uh, employer's location. And basically uh, between Carla, Dolores and I, we are kind of a full service. We provide a variety of services that are each slightly different and together we work as a team. So we refer to each program, each other, um, and each program has certain things that are slightly different. So that uh, pretty well summarizes it. We have sent uh, papers, um, attached files that Lindsay would have forwarded to you. Um, but basically I wanted to do this presentation so that the council members are aware that there are people out there that can provide assistance to employers who are looking to hire, who, who just have difficulty fi finding enough people here and want to look at the option of hiring foreign workers. Good. Thank you, Kathleen. Thank you. Any questions for them, council? And we, we do have the, uh, the documents that, you've, that you sent. So it was great, especially for the new council members, because uh, I think the, the others are aware of the work that you do. Go ahead, uh, Councillor Hatfield. Oh, wait a minute. Nope. Heather, hang on a second. Because I just did this once, but there I was. No, it's still not working. It worked when Gil tried it. Go ahead. <laughs> Hi, Kathleen, it's Heather. Um, is there a cost to the service for either the employer or the um, potential employee? For the employer, there's, there's no service, there's no cost. There's no cost to the service that I provide to employers. 
or that Carla provides to employers or that Dolores provides. If they are at the point that they want to recruit a foreign worker, the cost to the foreign worker is travel. Basically, they, sometimes the employers help them out with the travel cost. Um, it, it, when it comes to permanent residency, the candidate has to have a little bit of money in the bank. Uh, there are some financial requirements then, but as far as the service that we provide information on these programs and services, there's no, there's no, any help I give is free. Any more questions, folks? Good. Okay. Good. Thank you very much for hopping I, on. Can yep. I... So if I uh, can hold yeah, that by the uh, uh, Nova Scotia Office of Immigration. So we are already funded by that, and so it's coming from the Department of Immigration. Good, thank you. Kathleen, yeah, were you going uh, to share something else? Uh, just quickly, I, I will tell you another kind of ex exciting thing is that Western Wren just found out uh, this week, actually, or late last week, that we have been approved for funding from the federal immigration department called IRCC, Immigration Refugee Citizenship Canada, for a project called Local Immigration Partnership. And that project will hire a coordinator who will uh, work in the tri-counties to try to find out, I guess, coordinate people together, find out what the issues are. I pro probably you're familiar with housing issues and other, other things. Uh, so the person would work with community stakeholders to try to find solutions to the barriers around hiring foreign workers. So that's just going to happen very soon. Wow, that's a lot of layers. <laughs> it's, sorry, it, yeah. it's like it's just, we've, we've got groups that, you know, anyway, I guess it's good. Good, anybody else? All righty, thank you very much. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Bye now. Bye bye. Okay. CAO report. Any questions for the CAO? Did you need to share anything there? Uh, I guess I will share this since uh, we've just had an experience here that was less than ideal. Um, Council's aware that we've we purchased new council system, which uh, includes a new streaming uh, system that we'll have online within the next couple of weeks. Uh, we are also working with uh, Peter Muse, who installed initially, originally, all of the audio equipment that we have in chambers. Uh, Mike has been working with Peter to to look at making some upgrades, so some upgrades to our cameras, so that the images are sharper, high definition, perhaps. Uh, some some changes that will kind of bring us up, I guess, in terms of how we deal with these hybrid meetings so that the audio quality is, is enhanced. And uh, I guess the only other thing that I would, that I would offer there is that we should probably uh, insist that, that people who are making presentations uh, to us maybe turn on their camera so that at least you get the other visual cues. Yeah, that's uh, really hard. To the communication. It is hard uh, given the quality of the audio that we had today. Good. Any questions? Yeah. <clears throat> okay, fire department report. I, I don't know who's on there, so there's no report, but we must be, there must be some good news, like it's up and running. <laughs> fire department is 24-7, 365, your worship. Uh, always up and running. Uh, I can't even reach him to cut him in the head. <laughs> <laughs> I can't even throw something at you. Yeah, the, uh, the, I mean the, the, uh, the fire hall. I think yeah, everybody's so, really excited. So the fire that. hall, um, the, the capital project is complete. And uh, the, I know the department is very excited about getting it, uh, getting it used. Uh, currently, um, and this is a great, great opportunity for me to, to remind you of this, Currently under the public health orders, the indoor and outdoor gathering limits is 10 people, regardless of the capacity of the room. And so you'll note here today that none of the directors are physically present, and that is because of the public health order. Um, so from the fire hall perspective, though the capacity of that hall is, is enormous, they would be limited to a maximum of 10 people using it at this time. 
So they're working on their on their COVID protocol stuff uh, in case the the uh, in the case that and eventually it will change and, and the, we'll be allowed larger indoor limits and we all look forward to the opportunity to to use that facility for a variety of, of community uses. So uh, they're anxious and unfortunately this is the world we live in today. Mm. Good. Councillor McLeod. Um, thank you, Jeff. Uh, I had an opportunity to have a tour of the hall at the fire department as we speak and uh, can't wait to uh, to go out there. It's uh, reminded me of the day, er, early days when it was first built and we had lots of dances there and, uh, and things like that. So and I'm looking forward to the time when we can go out and use it more than we have now. So I had a tour of the whole facility. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Your Worship. Thank you. Good. Okay. Uh, operational services. Chad is Chad's on the call. Okay. So any questions for Chad? So we had some uh, correspondence come in with regard to sidewalks. Mm -hmm. Now I see both in yours and in um, in Chad's report. It said it just says that like they're still working on that. So. Um, so we'll just wait for that to be finished with regard to the sidewalks piece. Are there any questions for Chad? Anyone? Go ahead, uh, Councillor Hatfield. Chad, I'm just wondering under the compost facility, can you just clarify what that means um, that you have had requests from various retailers, vendors for permits to sell compostable and biogradable non-food products? Yes, yeah, sure. So. Um, Late last year, there was a amendment in our bylaw that now requires vendors and retailers to um, to obtain a permit from the town um, to sell um, um, products, non-food products such as um, cutlery and and plates and bowls and, and disposable plates and bowls and and packaging that is labeled uh, biodegradable or or compostable. <clears throat> so. Immediately after the bylaw um, uh, was amended, uh, I received a lot of emails and, and phone calls from, from local uh, retailers and vendors looking for uh, these permits. So the process includes um, the, the retailers either sending us samples of the products or, or, or staff has to go uh, on site to, to physically examine these products and, and we do some, some quick uh, rudimentary testing and so one local um, big box retailer submitted a list to us of actually 50 products and we're currently um, uh, in the process of, of um, issuing permits for 30 of those products which means 20 of the products that they they said submitted um, were declined for permits because they weren't um, even though they're labeled compostable um, they these products don't break down effectively uh, at our local facility. Uh, and some of the products actually, um, they weren't labeled compostable. They were just um, uh, a biodegradable product that, that weren't labeled compostable. So um, so 30, 30 out of the 50 uh, were issued permits. Chad, are they then taking this and composting it themselves? I'm, I'm still not clear on. Like, why are they buying these products? Sorry, I gotta turn my, my uh, speakers up here. Well, um, why are they buying these products? Um, there's some of these products, the label, labeling is a bit misleading. Um, they've been they've been deemed compostable by um, by I don't have the, the, the association names in front of me, but by certain institutes and associations that, that claim that these products are, are biodegradable or compostable, but the reality is that they don't break down effectively at our at our compost facility. <clears throat> a lot of the products that we decline permits for. 
um, use um, what's called a bioplastic. So if you, if you look at a, a product um, such as a bowl that is labeled um, biodegradable um, or, or have, has the term uh, soap proof on the labeling, typically that, that product has uh, a thin film of plastic um, and that thin film of plastic does not break down effectively at our site. Um, so I think that's what we're trying to achieve here is to kind of weed out these products that um, have been labeled uh, biodegradable or compostable um, that, that we cannot accept, not only, not only because they don't break down at a facility, it's awfully difficult for the haulers when they're picking up uh, organics to differentiate between um, a bioplastic and a regular plastic. Um, uh, sorry, I, I don't know if that um, yeah, th addresses that's your that's question. That's helpful, Chad. Yeah, that answers my question. It clarifies it. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Chad. Go ahead, Jeff. So I just wanted to add to, to the explanation <clears throat> about why this is so important to us. We, we take in like 5,000 tons of organic material each year into the compost facility, and out the other end comes approximately the same amount of, of compost. Um, and, and we put it in windrows and it, and it sits for a couple of years to cool and to, and to dry out and then we start screening it. And uh, in order to meet the, uh, the standards for Class A compost, we have to send samples to a lab, one liter samples to a lab from a pile randomly. And if it contains one piece of plastic or something that appears to be plastic greater than I think one centimeter in any dimension, then the whole pile is rejected. So uh, in order to get our, our compost screen to a level of class A compost that you can use in your yard, uh, the, the best way to achieve that is to make sure that no plastics or anything that looks like plastic or acts like plastic gets into the stream in the first place. So we depend on the haulers when they flip the lid of your, of your composter to look at it, and if they see plastic, flip the lid back down, put an orange sticker on it, and keep going and for the homeowner to do the responsible thing, which is make sure no plastics go in there. In the case of this labeling, the homeowners have been led to believe, because it's biodegradable, it's compostable, that this is okay. And it's, it leaves a whole education piece for us and, and ob obviously upset consumers if their green bin is left at the roadside, waste check has to get involved and say, no, the town doesn't accept those. So we would prefer that there be no products on the shelf that that could end up in the green card by a consumer being maybe misled. So, so that's the purpose of the bylaw amendment and it does result in a fair amount of work for Chad, but it's all, all with the right intention of, of allowing the system to work as it, was, as it was supposed to. Good. Go ahead there, Jim. I just have a general comment, uh, Chad and, uh, and Jeff and, and Jerry Varen. When we get to uh, look at our budget for uh, uh, the coming year, I'd be interested in how we can accommodate all the things that we've all asked for. So uh, it'll be an interesting and challenging time when we look at the budget. So, but thank you, Chad, for reports. I think the whole reports today from all the staff department heads are the best I've seen in, in, in uh, 35 years. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good. Anything else for Chad? Oh, good to go. Thank you. Um, operational planning and economic department report. So this is Natalie. Any questions for Natalie? This, the report is um, very thorough. And I, I see, uh, Natalie, are you on? Yes, I am. I, I see that uh, Jenny Wilkinson just 30 seconds ago won the um, won the space. It was this the win this space. So I think it's a thousand dollars a month towards rent for 12 months. For 12 mm -hmm. months. Uh, so yeah, so she won that, and then um, somebody came in second. Uh, Kylie, Kylie came in second with the uh i can't even think 
restaurant, Wild Goose? Yes. She's actually, yes. So this is good. Yeah, so the, the tea room, and I want to say the British goods, I guess. Uh, British boutique goods. And tea room, mm -hmm. yes. Yeah, yeah, so she won. Well, she'll be located in the town, so. Yes. That's very good news. Yeah, it, it is, and especially the retail side, right? Like, it's great to have more retail. And then the, um, the second place was Kylie with the, is it Wild Roots? I should know the name. Wild, wild Goose, I believe. Yeah, she's she's actually serving dinner at my place tonight, so um, so it was great to see that as well. It's just I, I think she gets a free membership uh, to Ignite and a website. Correct. So yeah, and and then um, then Natalie and I had a conversation with Ignite around basically the others the others that had applied. So we don't want to lose them. There's some really great potential for those businesses going forward. We don't. We just don't want to lose, lose sight of, of everything that they put forward. So it's really exciting. So, yeah. Any any questions for Natalie? Go ahead, there, Councillor McLeod. Natalie, any any on your desk? The deadline is sooner than later. Just curious. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, Jim. I, it, it, mural I applications. Mur Any? Uh, mural, mural application. Um, actually, I have one on my physical desk, and um, we're expecting some more to be in tomorrow. Uh, the approach that the society is going to take is wait and see the, the quality of the applications and then work with the applicants, those that are desirable uh, to completion in the sense of uh, uh, finalizing all the details so that it can be juried and then obviously presented uh, at a committee of the whole. Thank you. Did you have a chance to look at my PDF that I sent you? About the, yes, uh, I did, and I shared it with the society. Uh, we thought it was uh, a really good document that we can have as a benchmark uh, for each mural uh, so that we can have it cataloged uh, uh, similar to the, to the way that report. So uh, everyone thought that that report was, would, will be really valuable and we'll also uh, put it on the website as well. Oh, wonderful. Thank you. I'll be more than pleased with that. That brought a tear to my eye when the mural, which is we created in 1995 and is still looking as good as it is and couldn't be better for being uh, 30 or 25 years old plus. Thanks very and much, we Natalie. Appreciate it. We appreciate it. Anything for anything else? I guess we're good. Thank you. Thank you. We we're going to we did do an addition under dangerous and unsightly, so we're going to have some questions there. But um, I think we'll be good. All righty, uh, engineering. Mark Grophy. Are there any questions? His report is there. Any questions for our engineer? Guess we're good. Finance. Uh, there's no report, but the, I guess the question on everybody's mind is when do we start budget? Do we know? Yeah, good afternoon. Uh, well, Mr. We're, we're, we're actually working on the budgets now as we saw as we talk. Um, uh, it's going through, I think we have the capital budget pretty much finalized to present to council. Uh, we'll be doing that next month. And in the meantime, we're uh, just kind of at the early stages of the operational budget. Um, a little bit later th this year than normal. Uh, a lot of stuff, other stuff going on. But uh, December statements, I, I typically go through December uh, being the end of the third quarter in uh, quite some detail. Uh, we use those numbers to kind of base and predict where we'll end up in March and also help us forecast our budget and predict our budget for next year. Uh, so I'm pretty much done that. I'll be done that probably by the end of tomorrow. Uh, so next week, uh, information will be going to directors for their input and uh, we'll bring all that back. And I'm hoping that uh, in a month's time, we'll have some operational considerations for budgets for next year as well. 
Uh, as far as the current year goes, we are tracking right along our, our budget. Uh, we're just a little bit better than uh, what we planned year to date. Um, I'm not getting too excited over it because there's a lot of a lot of things happen in uh, February and March as far as uh, accounting entries go. Uh, but it's it's we're, we're doing okay for as far as our current year budget. I uh, just wanted to update you that uh, you may start hearing some rumors and seeing some things uh, through Mike and communications about us moving towards a new parking system. It's uh, hotspot parking, and uh, this will allow our parking enforcement uh, a little better data. Uh, we actually can take GPS readings against license plates where they're parked, and two hours later confirm that that vehicle's not moved. So. Uh, that kind of thing is some new technology that we're moving into for, for parking. Uh, and then again on uh, EFTs, electronic fund transfers. So accounts payable now is actively uh, sending forms out to many vendors and any requests that we've had from vendors to start paying an EFT, we've set them up. So EFT seems to be working quite well for us. Awesome. So. So Jerry, the hotspot parking, I'm actually a member, but I, so when I go to the city, it's easier to just park and it, it, I think it comes off the credit card or something like that. Um, so do we, yeah. ha we have to put in they, like new, go ahead, new meters and yeah, stuff? No, it, no, it's not a new meter. It'll be uh, what, the, it'll be if they can still have the option to come to town to actually pay tickets and get permits, but they can also do those, those things online. Uh, so they wouldn't have to necessarily come into the town hall to pay a ticket. They could pay them online or even get their permits. Gotcha. Okay. That's exciting. Yeah, it'll be, it'll be different. Yeah. Okay, any questions for Jerry? Good. Go ahead, CAL. Uh, Your Worship, uh, I met yesterday with Jerry to go over, the, I guess, the draft capital budget. And uh, we're very, very close, as he's indicated, to having something ready for council, but we didn't want to spring it on you the day before for a meeting today. So uh, we'll talk with Mark and Chad and the others that are affected, and if it makes sense to try and get you together to look at that prior to, to next month, then we'll, we'll do that with your, if you're in agreement. Um, but, it, but at this point, uh, we haven't had that discussion to see if there's some urgency within the, uh, within the department. So. Um, that to just be prepared that we may ask you for a special meeting. Good. Perfect. Anything else? We're good. Okay. Thank you, Jerry. Uh, Yarmouth okay. Recreation. Frank's on. So the reports in front of us. Any questions there? What was the result of the uh, active transportation? I think that went to Modi last night. Good news. Um, and Globe uh, has been awarded the contract and negotiations have started with them. So uh, very excited that uh, Modi will be pursuing an active transportation project along the mile stretch. Now that's really good. Yeah, good news. Okay, any questions for Frank, anyone? We're good. Okay, thank you. All right, uh, truck route, put truck route on. I did? I might, okay. I might have put truck route on because we have, we still have trucks coming through and driving over our curbs. Didn't we talk about that? Yes, that's why you put it on. That's it's why. On email. Oh, okay. See, I can't, that's what happens when you hit 60. <laughs> just, a head, just a heads up, except for Jim. It doesn't happen to Jim. So, so I don't, I mean, I don't know what, the, I have no idea what the truck route is, if we need to start talking about it, but we can't have big trucks coming down our main street, period, they're not supposed to, I didn't think, and, um, and coming up over the, the curbs. So I don't know what to do with this one, except, go ahead. So, so we do have a truck route, Your Worship, a truck route bylaw. Uh, it has daytime routes and nighttime routes. There's more options in the daytime than the nighttime, but some streets are, are never an option as far as uh, uh, through traffic. Now the caveat is, is that uh, trucks can deviate from the truck route in order to make a delivery. So if you have a, uh, 
a, a police officer who sees a truck going down the street, it doesn't mean that that truck is necessarily uh, behaving badly if they have a delivery that they're taking the shortest route to get to. So you may see big trucks on Main Street, even though Main Street downtown is not part of the truck route for that reason. You may also see trucks on Main Street downtown Yarmouth because people are not adhering to the truck route. I'm not saying that's not happening, but you could legitimately be seeing big trucks on Main Street downtown and other streets downtown as a result of the fact that they're making deliveries. So that leads to another um, issue, which is uh, which is brought up actually during our previous council. There was uh, Councillor Hood would often uh, speak to the fact that we should consider a bylaw that that puts a, a size limit on trucks. Period, that are on certain streets in in our town, uh, as they they don't fit, uh, and uh, and so they drive up over our curbs. They drive up, uh, you know, in areas where we're never intended for trucks to be. So that would require uh, the the companies that are that are transporting goods uh, to find other ways, and that could involve uh, transferring to smaller vehicles, or it could could involve people receiving uh, small goods, I suppose, to go and pick them up at a depot. Um, but I think that's that was the proposal, Your Worship, that was discussed uh, with previous council, not at the council table, just in conversation, that perhaps uh, it might be time to consider a bylaw that restricts large trucks, period, to some parts of town. Okay. So should we do that? If, um, if council were uh, believing that that was something you'd like to investigate, then a motion uh, to direct staff to, to investigate the feasibility. And so uh, what, I, what we would do in that is that we would, we would obviously uh, make some calls, have some meetings, uh, get, get a sense of what other communities are doing with, with regard to this, give you back a staff report and potentially a bylaw. Bylaw would go through a process of first and second reading and, and obviously we would solicit uh, input not only from the general public but from the community that it, that it would most affect, which would be the, the transport community. So uh, we can undertake the beginnings of that uh, if council believes that you'd like to go down that road. It's part of the fun. Go ahead, Councillor. <clears throat> Thank you, Jeff. It isn't only the trucks that deliver product to the different retail stores and offices on within the central business district. There are other trucks, the larger half ton or whatever trucks uh, that go, that are drive through the downtown and sometimes are frustrated when they have to go out more than they would like to go out and, and so it isn't though it, it's those trucks too that that are that are upsetting our bump outs and i don't know how you overcome that first and from a pharmacy point of view i did overcome it and uh, but uh, i not many people have the same options that i had i don't know but i want to support if if you're if you're suggesting a motion i want to support the motion i'll make that motion and uh, but I sure want to have a good discussion when staff comes and, and it's, it'll take more than a month to get a get something to us it'll be a couple of months or more because there's a lot of work in that you're going to be up you're going to be upsetting or making people ang angry whatever you know but uh, I just but I think we have to proceed and and I'll make that motion as, okay. as per what Jeff said uh, Lindsay so can do we have a clear motion? Because I don't understand the clear motion. Go ahead. Uh, Your Worship, I would suggest that the motion might be to, to direct staff to investigate the uh, uh, restricting of large uh, trucks in, um, we'll say, in the downtown. Uh, yeah. I don't know if, if Councillor Jim is thinking of other areas. Well, I, I initially, the central business district. You know that's that's where I'm at, but it isn't just that all the streets. We are an old, we are an old we are an old, an old town. You know we can't make the streets wider, and we make one some of them one as a one-way street now, which is which is great. But I still got some complaints about that. Three complaints actually. So, but we have to. It, I think we should have to deal with it. Okay, Councillor Dares. Um, I just want to say I'll second the motion uh, because I'd really like to see the information, but. 
but I also think that people have to understand that when those streets were built, deliveries were made by horse and cart. And yeah. so, uh, you know, sometimes you've got to adjust to accommodate the fact that uh, deliveries are made by large trucks these days. Um, so maybe there is a way, and I'd love to see the staff report. But uh, I just think that there should be a recognition of that. Thank you. Good point. Good, really good point. <laughs> you know what? Jim, you should have remembered that. <laughs> but right now, he hasn't. <laughs> he's, right, he's right here on my shoulder. But it's a really good point. I guess we had talked... We had talked some time ago about the big transport trucks going out to the stations and then bringing just the cube vans or something like that, right? Like how do you maneuver? So it'll be good to get that information. So it's been moved and seconded. Is there any more discussion on this one? Okay, all those in favor? Aye. Contrary? Motion carried, thank you. Uh, we took out B, request for a decision mitigation action plan. So that's DeMario and he will be joining us on the big screen. Test, test, can you guys hear me? We can, we can't see you though. <laughs> uh, I must apologize, I don't actually have a camera at my desktop. Okay, all right. Okay, so uh, thank you for having me again. Uh, this is a request for decision uh, to have two things accepted. The first would be the actual Town of Yamit mitigation action plan. Uh, this was a document that was, the de development of this document was undertaken as a part of a grant from the Federation of Canadian Municipalities, FCM, as a part of the MSIP program, which is Municipalities for Climate Change Innovation Grant Program. Uh, so first to accept the document, and then the second is to accept the recommendation in the document to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 20% below the 2016 levels by the year 2030. Okay. Go ahead, CAO. So Your Worship, uh, DeMario's done uh, some excellent work here in terms of uh, preparing this plan over the last uh, He's worked on it uh, as, as his primary uh, priority, but not certainly not the only thing he's worked on over the last year, uh, two years actually. Um, and the, the, the initiative is about, um, is about climate change, and it's about reducing our greenhouse gases as a corporation, as a town, not, not as a community, as a corporation. And so this is th what he's suggesting is that uh, a target of 20% below the 2016 levels is what we should shoot for by 2030. And his report includes a, a number of thoughts around how we might achieve that. Uh, what we would do going forward if, if his recommendations are, are accepted is we would form an in-house uh, ad hoc team that would work to, to prioritize, I guess, where the low-hanging fruit is and bring forward with budget and, and recommendations to council on an annual basis on how we can achieve those, uh, those targets over by 2030. And uh, I believe DeMario is calling for a quarterly reporting on, uh, on our, our progress to council. So uh, he's done excellent work and, and he's to be commended for this. And uh, I think the target that, that he is recommending here, obviously he and I have talked about this uh, previously. I think <coughs> it's uh, achievable, might be achievable before 2030. Uh, and, and we should view this process as we set a target, we achieve it, we set another target, and we work towards that. So this is, this is step one for the council, if you accept this in having a, a uh, articulated goal around greenhouse gas emissions. Good, thank you. So, so the motion for somebody to make is to approve uh, the Town of Yarmouth Mitigation Action Plan as part of a requirement from the Federation of Canadian Municipalities, FCM for climate change innovation uh, grant program to approve the town's agreed upon greenhouse gas emissions reduction target of 20% below 2016 levels by 2030. Go ahead, uh, Councillor Hatfield. Um, yeah, I would make both of those motions. Okay, so can we put it in one? Okay, so we'll put it in one. Thank you, Councillor. Who wants to second that? Everybody? Okay, Councillor Cleveland. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody, go ahead there, Councillor. Yeah, just one quick question. Um, when I was reading through the, re 
the, uh, the action plan, I noticed that um, the cost of energy showing for 2016 for the town of Yarmouth to maintain municipal operations. And I'm wondering if, if maintaining municipal operations included the Mariner Center. I don't believe it did, but DeMario, do you want to clarify that? Yes, it did include the Mariner Center. Okay, I'm wrong. <laughs> okay, I was just surprised by the by the numbers then, so I'll I'll, uh, I'll look into it further. Thank you. Good. Did you have more questions for him? Or are you good? You good? Okay. Go ahead. I just have a, a general question, uh, Jeff. Um, Demario's been with us for two years, and he was here on a grant program. Is that is part of this going to? Keep him on for for us, and and uh, mm -hmm. I just he's a wonderful asset on yeah. Main Street. So, so to be clear, uh, Demario was with us before we got the grant. Uh, he was part of our our two engineer uh, plan, and uh, we were lucky, uh, fortunate, uh, to to be able to tap into this uh, this FCM program. And Demario was was very qualified and capable of, of executing that program. So it became part a priority of his work, but his employment is not tied to, to this program. He will be lead in charge of, of, of helping us see this through over the coming years uh, as one of the many things he'll do for us. But um, we will lose that grant, but DeMario uh, on the corner of his desk on many things he does has been working on other grants uh, to, to assist us. And actually, we're going to talk about one of his successes at the water utility meeting later today. And uh, so uh, we talked about having a grant writer uh, with the town. We're currently in the process of, of, of filling that position. And DeMario will work closely with that person because of his success and what, he is, what he's learned in that area. Uh, that person will be, be tied in with engineering. So. Demario will be here for the long run, and uh, we'll we'll make sure that uh, that uh, as as we're holding ourselves accountable, we'll we'll put the pressure on Demario for our success. <laughs> so first, that's good to hear, and secondly, I spoke with him on a regular basis when he was uh, working with Mark on main on the Main Street upgrade. So that's wonderful to hear. He's a he's a good guy, and a, and an expert in EIT engineering training. So I'm going to celebrate when he becomes an engineer. He already has become an engineer. Yeah, okay, thank you for that. <laughs> that he, I haven't seen him lately. I haven't seen him oh, lately. I was talking to him when he was EIT, yeah. Councillor, would you like to add celebration to this meeting? <laughs> Life's what a journey. Think? It is. Go ahead. Sorry, just one more quick question. Um, just wondering if you could direct me to where I would find um, in the report the energy cost or the consumption that uh, the Mariner Center, where that would be c covered in the report? It's it's not explicitly broken out in the report, but I can send you something after the meeting in regards to what the Mariner Center's uh, numbers were. Great, thank you so much. Good, all right. Okay, so any further discussion? Okay, Wonderful. all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Contrary? Motion carried. Thanks, Demario. Thank you. Waste check presentation. Who put that on? Your Worship, I think there was a suggestion that uh, from, from one of the council members of waste check that uh, that we invite Waste Check to do a presentation that they recently had at their meeting, and it escapes me at the moment which councillor that that came from. So, if if that was you, please speak up. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah, possibly that was me in an email, Jeff. And uh, basically, they've uh, for presentations they've uh, done for other councils, and they would be more than happy to come here as well, but they require invitation. That's all. Thank you. So we just have to decide if he wants them to come present. Okay. So we, I need a motion for them to come if that's what you're after. Okay. Moved by Councillor Dares. Second by Deputy. 
Uh, question. Questions called, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Contrary? Motion carried. Proposed housing discussion with Andrew Cameron. Is that you? Yeah, I'll take that. Okay. So, Your Worship, uh, Mr. Cameron is the, uh, the developer who has developed Ocean Breeze Estates that we're all familiar with up on the Haley Road uh, and several other uh, units on the Jarvis Road and several other units uh, around, around town of similar, of similar nature. So typically he develops four or six unit single level um, uh, rentals. Uh, I believe he's been very successful with his, with his development. Uh, he's recently advised me, uh, give me a call and told me that for now he is done, that he's not going to continue to, to build more units at this time. He does, does have some thoughts around affordable housing and, and housing in general, and he was very much interested in engaging in a discussion with council about his thoughts. And I thought given the number of units that he has built, owns and operates within our town, and his level of interest in the topic that what I said to him is I'd bring it to you for consideration. Mm -hmm. um, you know, obviously, because of our numbers, it'd be hard to bring him into the room um, and probably more efficient if, uh, if he lives in Amherst, so yes. it might be more efficient for him to join us on, on, on a connection such as this sometime in the next couple of months, mm -hmm. um, if, you're, if you're willing and interested in having that conversation. I, yeah, I had the converse, same conversation with him too, and Natalie keeps up to date with, with him as well. Uh, yeah, so it's it always good to hear th yeah, thoughts. Yeah, it would be a public meeting, Your Worship. It's not a private audience with council or anything yeah. like that. Yeah, I don't think he's looking for anything from council. I think he's just wanting to share mm -hmm. some of his experiences. He's worked with Housing Nova Scotia on some of his units, uh, yeah. and, and I think he just genuinely wants to He's invested in this community, and I think he, he has some things he'd like to share and discuss. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe he doesn't have the solutions, but would like to discuss the topics. Yeah, certainly. Okay. Go ahead. Uh, Your Worship, uh, just if, if, uh, if some kind of a invitation is required, I'd like to make that motion. I think it's a discussion that continuously needs to be had, and uh, so I, I, with, with great pride, I would mm -hmm. invite him to come make some kind of an arrangements for a public meeting. Um, I think on a grander scale, we need, to, we need to talk about this over and over and over again, so. Good, so moved. Second by deputy. Any discussion? Questions. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Contrary? Motion carried. Request for decision 26 Commercial Street. Dangerous and unsightly. Uh, Your Worship, I don't know if Natalie wants to speak to this or if she would like me to, so I'm throwing it out there. Uh, I don't mind, Jeff. I'll leave it up to you. Okay. <laughs> so, Your Worship, we have a uh, we have a property, 26 Commercial Street, on which there have been a couple of orders uh, issued, and the uh, the property owner has not been responsive in terms of those um, those orders. Now, on the most recent order, the order is an order to demolish if not, if not uh, complied with. And uh, because it's in order to demolish, there is an opportunity for appeal, as there is with any order, um, the, uh, there is an opportunity for an appeal to council. So I don't think the, uh, the property owner has, they're obviously not present, um, but I'll ask Natalie and, and Lindsay, you haven't heard from the property owner that he was planning to appeal today? No, as of today, we have no record of the phone call or any uh, mail uh, to uh, the planning department. Okay, so as you can tell from the pictures, Your Worship, the, uh, the building is, has suffered a significant structural um, failure and uh, the recommendation from the, um, well, the order from the, from the uh, administrator is that the building may be demolished. So Your Worship, it may be appropriate um, for council to indicate its wishes by way of motion. Uh, if you wish for the, uh, for the work to proceed for demolition, if not complied with, uh, if the latest order is not complied with. Um, in terms of cost, uh, I haven't sized this one up, but you're probably 
looking at something in the order of, uh, of $10,000, uh, give or take. Uh, it's a fairly small place, but you do have to hire, hire a contractor to, to remove. Uh, they have, there's tipping fees associated with it, and, uh, and then it obviously leaves the property in, uh, in some um, kind of safe state. Uh, I, I should point out that the, the cost of demolition, if we proceed, does, is placed on the property as a lien uh, and, is, and is due as, as, as our taxes. It's, the property would not belong to the town at this point. Um, the property ownership does not change hands. Um, the property owner then has a significant bill uh, if they leave it to us to do and uh, then we have a collection issue and sometimes your worship just in the interest of full full disclosure often when we do this these properties come up for tax sale uh, in uh, in a couple years time and very rarely do we get a full recovery of the of the demolition cost okay so my question is you know, the minutiae, I don't understand it. So the lien versus adding it to the taxes, is it the same thing? Okay, so so then um, so then we would add approximately $10,000 to the taxes. The taxes, if the taxes don't get paid, it goes to tax sale. Okay, gotcha. All right. Oh, sorry, go ahead, Councillor Hatfield. Um, Natalie, um, I think we've already had this discussion, but I just, um, again, this building from the exterior is not particularly unsightly building, uh, and we have a lot of unsightly buildings in our town. So how did this one get identified uh, as it is to be demolished over some of the others? So uh, this particular building had a uh, 911 call that there was a fire at the house. When the fire department arrived, they discovered that the fire was actually outside of the house beside the building. There was some brush and debris had built up. And at that point in time, uh, fire department uh, went into the building because some of the fire had spread into that and then discovered uh, the state of the, of the inside of the property. The, the floor had imploded uh, there was debris, it, it was in a really uh, difficult state. So they contacted uh, the building official and the building official went and did a uh, property assessment and then determined that uh, the building was in no fit state. So uh, he then, as a typical process, uh, reached out to the property owner, uh, received no response and it's, it's led to today's uh, recommendation. To know what was the inside of the building actually looked like. Without the fire, we wouldn't have known, she said. Correct. Okay, Jim? I'll make a motion to uh, recommend that council approve the demolition of the building as, as indicated in 1.0. I just have a, a comment. Uh, um, are the taxes current? Uh, uh, are the taxes on the building by, paid by the owner, are they current? As far as you know, maybe, maybe it's not relevant. I, I don't have that information. I don't know if Natalie does. I, I, I would have to, to verify that. I'm sorry, I don't have that that's, with me. That's fine, don't be sorry. Um, so, so moved. Okay. Your Worship. Okay. Yeah. Go ahead, Heather. Was that you going to? Yeah. Okay. Second by Gail. Uh, okay. Go ahead. Uh, uh, just a question around the process that follows. Mm. Um, if the homeowner owns a, an additional property, like the property, the cost, if we don't recover it, is on the property or responsibility of the homeowner? Like I'm thinking if they own an, another property, can the lien be put on the property owner in a, in a different way um, to make sure that part's paid and we're not left with a bill for somebody not taking care of the property? Solicitor can answer that, go ahead. Yeah, so the, um, the, the 
placing the demolition cost has to be on the property that um, that it's related to. However, there is you do have the ability also to to essentially sue the uh, property owner to recover the amount. So it's a separate action. It's not um, you just can't place the the cost on the taxes as you could with that. But if you know, I don't know anything. I think it's a Mr. Blavelt, is it a Randall? Blava, I, I don't know anything about him, whether he owns other property or not. But he, you could sue him essentially like in small claims court, for example, and get a judgment against him and then pursue that in another way. So I think the question came up once a few years ago when there was another landowner in town. And, and so, yeah, there is an ability to, to have a separate action against that person. Um, if we approve the, the recommendation today, when will I see the demolition of that building? I, <clears throat> ideally, um, so we would have to go and have a special council meeting following this. This is Committee of the Whole, right? So let's have a special council meeting so that this decision is effective today. Uh, I don't know. Uh, N Natalie can, can clarify if Glenn has had any response at all from this property owner. I would hope that knowing that the town was going to come in and do this work, uh, they might proceed to do it themselves because then it's not a lien on the property and, and maybe they can arrange to do it cheaper than we will, right? Um, if, if we see no action or we don't have a responsive property owner, uh, it'll be a matter of, uh, of Glenn finding a contractor who is able to mobilize and, and do the work. So it won't be tomorrow, but it would, might be within the next couple weeks. Correct. Okay. We good? So motion's been made and seconded. Good? All, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Contrary? Motion carried. Uh, Lindsay or Jeff maybe remind me at the end to have a, that council meeting if everybody's good with that okay Splash Park so uh, okay so the, there's a request from the Splash Park we have the um, you have it in front of you I just have to bring it up because I have to bring everyone up separately so there's a there's a, a couple of, of things here including their budget and their ask from the three municipal units each whatever that amount was there it is twenty thousand thirty eight thousand seven 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 um, from each of the three units uh, and then, of course, operating costs on top of that. So go ahead there, Deputy. I'd just like to say I'm very impressed with the, the report. Um, we already approved it the last time they came, and they went back and did a whole lot more work and included finances and whatnot. So kudos to the hard work of that committee. And uh, I personally would like to make a motion to approve the $38,777.77 toward the capital costs of developing a $349,000 splash park at Mariner Center contingent on all funding being secured as outlined in the splash parks presentation ownership of the splash park will transfer upon completion to the owners slash funders of the Mariner Center and ongoing operations will be part of the Mariner Center good go ahead Councillor Dayers so I'll second the motion and I'd also like to uh, I'd like to see someday that that would be complemented by a boundless playground that would adjoin it and uh, that would complete the entire package I think yeah. but I will second the motion thank you good stuff okay moved and seconded any discussion on this go ahead councillor does our uh, 38 777 decimal 77 come from next year's budget I don't know I go ahead uh, your worship that would depend on how how quickly they are successful in securing all of the funding for the 349 uh, so there's a piece there that has to come from other levels of government and there's a piece there for fundraising so um, I'm not anticipating our money would have to flow next fiscal year to be honest uh, there's quite a bit of work left to be done 
uh, and the construction season is is what it is, right? It's, it's close, so, yeah. and, and some of this stuff might be, uh, there might be a lead time for ordering it as well. Mm -hmm. So I'm anticipating perhaps the next year, so I think we're safe to make this commitment uh, ahead of planning our capital budget for, for this year. Um, yeah, and it's a, it's, it's, I say it's a good commitment because it's, um, you know where I sit with regional projects? It's not a third, a third, a third. It's, it's our right. percentages, but, um, I was going to make that comment. That was yeah. my second and final comment that uh, it dangerous. should be here, here, and here, yeah. you know. Anyway, that's. Treading on dangerous can't help ground. How I, but sorry, that can't help how I feel. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, me, me too. Okay. Any more questions? Discussion? Questions called? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Contrary? Motion carried in 90 seconds. It's true. The, the standing joke is always that we can we can talk about three million dollars for thirty seconds, but if we want to spend fifty dollars, it might take us three hours to discuss. Right? So good. Okay. Thank you. Um, opening Water Street at UCAO. Hmm. So, Your Worship, it may be a surprise to, to some of you that Water Street isn't entirely a street. Uh, there <laughs> uh, there's a section of Water Street um, down below, down towards the, and including um, part of the wastewater uh, treatment plant that at one time was, was part of a uh, railway line and was expropriated, I believe, Greg, uh, if you recall, expropriated from the railway company. Uh, so this piece of property extends uh, from the treatment plant almost as far as Houston Street. So that, when you're driving, That's Houston, Houston Street. Is Houston. that where Myra's is? Is that Houston? That's where, um, yes, that's right. Yeah, okay. So all of that part of Water Street isn't technically a street. It's a piece of town property uh, that has a, pay, uh, a strip of pavement on it. Uh, but it isn't, it's never been made officially a town street. And so that's just simply a, a, a motion of, of council to do that. And it hasn't really mattered up until recently. And, and why it matters now is that we do have some, some properties that abut that, it, that it is their only uh, access to the street and we can't issue a development permit uh, if it doesn't have frontage on a street. And technically it's not a street. So I'm gonna ask you, uh, to pass a motion, I'll get you the pit here, that the Town of Yarmouth uh, designate uh, the property, and I'll give you the property number, it's 9019673 as a street in the Town of Yarmouth, as an extension of Water Street in the Town of Yarmouth. And by motion alone, you can turn a regular old piece of land into a part of Water Street. Am I right about that, Greg? <laughs> yes. <I think> <laughs> Cleveland. Your Worship, we absolutely have to make that a street. <laughs> and it should be called water. <laughs> it's just my thought, but I'll make that motion. Thank you. And Councillor I'll, I'll second it. Thank you. <laughs> Moved and seconded. If we name it something else, like ATV Trail, can they come? <laughs> That's a good one. Right. There you go. That's right. That's the other side. <laughs> <laughs> so let's be strategic in our going forward plan. Gosh, okay. Any more discussion on this one? <laughs> All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Contrary? Motion carried. Thank you. Uh, request for decision accessibility advisory committee policy amendment. Who had that one? That, that is me, Mayor. Okay. So, uh, Mayor, this is a quick one. Uh, when we did the last amendment, uh, there was an oversight. We had identified the Accessibility Advisory Committee to uh, report to the Committee of the Whole Committee. Oh, yes. And I believe 
in these situations, it should be, a, it's an advisory committee of council and they should report to town council. So that is the change uh, that I'm recommending um, to amend the policy. Yeah, yeah, that was the only, I remember it was crossed out every, yeah, good. Okay, um, any discussion on that? Can I have a motion? Mm -hmm. Councillor uh, Lesser put his hand up. Second by Councillor Dares. Any more discussion on this one? Questions called, all those in favor? Aye, contrary, motion carried. Thanks again, Natalie. Thank you. Correspondence, anything for action? I don't see anything there. Um, previously distributed. So under the previously distributed, we're putting all of the, um, we've got the congratulations from the museum, uh, other letters, um, golf scramble, and we're adding all of the correspondence we get with regard to the Y building under there is when I get them, I send them to Lindsay. So they may end up on here or on a council meeting, either one, they will, they will all be, uh, and I am emailing council by the way, which you all know, but the, to make sure everybody has that. Okay, additions, um, only there's one addition, dangerous and unsightly. Councillor, uh, Councillor Hatfield, we, you were uh, interested in that one, I know so. We spent some time driving around, around the town identifying what we deemed as being dangerous and unsightly properties. And um, trying to look at how we can remedy some of these issues. Um, I know the new bylaw that we've just put in place will be helpful and hopefully will lead us to, to do some of those uh, issues. I think when Commercial Street came up on the agenda, it caused me some co concern um, in that, in fact, that was probably one of the better looking from the outside buildings that we have that are va is vacant in the town. Many of them look much worse than, than that building did. And so the only reason that entrance was gained into the building to determine how bad it was was because there happened to be a fire outside. But if that fire had not occurred, then that would not, we wouldn't have known what it was like inside. So I guess my question is, is how many of these other buildings are dangerous inside? What are the conditions? How often are they being checked? Uh, what is the process? What is the procedure? And if there isn't, I would really like to have something put in place so that we can follow up on, on these. There are people living next door and across the street from these houses that are maintaining their homes, that are paying their taxes, and they're looking out their windows and they're seeing these vacant buildings that have been boarded up for many, many years in some cases. So, you know, is there a limitation on how long people can board up windows and that kind of, kind of thing, so. Well, it's a good start. Good. I agree 100% um, when you're out talking to, during the campaign or you're talking to citizens, they often say that, why here, why not there? So thank you for asking that question earlier, for clarifying that. And I do think if it was a quicker process when we do identify them, it would be better because there is quite a few buildings like that around. Yeah, it, it's the buildings. It's also, because um, I went out with Councillor Hatfield, we did, we did, I think I put over 50 kilometers on the vehicle. And, and we just drove up and down each street. But, but some of the steps that are, dangerous like um and also uh, because i'm not an expert there but but uh, councillor hatfield understand if, if it's more than a fourplex there's more than four apartments apartments the fire marshal has or fire inspector has to go in every three years and and inspect that for fire safety um and so you look at some of these buildings and a few in particular that you can identify are four or more and you just have to question how they could ever pass a fire inspection. You know, I have a building with four units and I know when they came into my place, you know, there was things that I had to do that I wasn't aware of. And I think my building was in better condition than there. So I just, I just worry about the fact that we have people living in these buildings that they are unsafe and they're living there because they don't have any other options probably. Um, but it is, it's, uh, some of them, it's a sad state of affairs. Yeah, so those, 
um, yeah, it's outside. For looking on the outside, you see that, but we have no idea what's inside. So um, someone at this table who delivers food to people in need has seen the inside, right? And, and um, it, we just, we have to make sure that our people are safe. So how do you, uh, how do you do that? <laughs> Go ahead, CAO. So two weeks ago, council passed second reading of a much revamped uh, vacant buildings bylaw. Mm -hmm. So this does require monthly inspections by somebody qualified. Uh, you know, it doesn't need to be us, but somebody needs to be looking at the buildings and reporting much more information collected by the town on these buildings. And uh, uh, so we're early days. Uh, an ad would have ran last week making this law. So, um, mm -hmm. you know, bear with us. We, we yeah. This didn't happen for no reason. We recognize there's an issue. And yeah. so the bylaw was created and, and this will give us a better tool. Also on the unsightly side of things, I know Natalie and I have had discussion uh, prompted largely by the long list uh, provided. So the list is being reviewed and, and uh, Natalie's reviewing process within the department to ensure that there's regular follow-up and, and consistency of the application of the dangerous and unsightly. Um, as I've said to, to Pam, it's, a, it's an on, sorry, your worship, it's, a, it's an ongoing uh, issue. Um, you know, not all property owners uh, value the, the, um, the appearance or or seem to respect the the impact of their of their behavior or their tenants' behavior on on the neighbors and on the neighborhood. So that's where we sort of get in there, and it's it's a bit subjective too. Um, but generally, most times, uh, our bylaw enforcement officer, when he engages with someone, uh, generally we get good results. So um, you know we're we're on it. There's a lot there. It isn't the only thing on his plate. Uh, so he is dedicating a piece of his time to this file. There's also the piece he dedicates to, to um, uh, collections, mm -hmm. uh, collecting our, our water rates and our tax rates. So um, he's on it. Uh, as far as the, the dangerous and unsightly outside of the vacant buildings, and you know, I, I, I hear you, um, you talk about the conditions that people live in. Um, we do have a couple of bylaws that come in play. One is dangerous, sorry, one is the dangerous and unsightly, and the other is the minimum housing standards. So, um, you know, what we see from the outside and you can see from the road, you can act on from dangerous and unsightly. The minimum housing standards uh, is a pretty good bylaw and allows our building inspector to go in at the invitation of somebody living as a tenant. So it can be a one unit, two unit, three unit, doesn't have to be at the level that the fire inspector is, it, it's on his rotation. So it does require uh, people to, to say enough is enough and, and to call the town in because the landlord has not been responsive. Now, that puts us in a difficult spot. We're between the landlord and the tenant. Um, <coughs> excuse me, we do give the landlord opportunity to, to comply with, with a little more than, than a letter, a nudge, mm -hmm. to, to, that these things need to be done. And again, um, our, our officer has, has pretty good success with, with compliance. There have been situations where we have vacated uh, a building until compliance was, was received. Doesn't happen often. Usually the items are able to be, to be addressed. Sometimes, uh, you know, we get brought into uh, what, are, what are essentially landlord-tenant disputes. And there's, there's uh, you know, we get half the story and we get into it and it, you know, it, it gets complicated and you just have a really poor relationship between the landlord and the tenant. What we're concerned about is the condition of the, exactly. of the living accommodation. So, yeah, exactly. so that's kind of where we focus, but yeah. navigating can be a little difficult, but it requires, like our, our, our inspector isn't entering apartment buildings and inspecting, he no, goes no. in on invitation. Yeah, and, and so, uh, so I get those calls obviously I get them and I explain to the tenants, you have to invite them in. And the first response is always, if I do that, they'll kick me out. So I guess we just need to know that you can't, well, during COVID, you can't evict anybody anyway. So it's good news to get some stuff cleaned up but during COVID. Um, so I'm just, just full disclosure, I'm gonna, I am going to post that again. I have posted it in the past just for people to say like, you know, if it's, and it, and it is, it, your window won't shut, 
you know, there's cold air coming, there's all those things, rats, all, there, all those things that are below standards uh, need to be, you know, need to be looked at. So I, I guess part of, and I keep going back to COVID because you can't be evicted during COVID, um, might be a good time to encourage people to let, you know, let somebody in and take a peek at those things. And you're absolutely Jeff, like it's a, whatever's going on with them is not our place, but it is our place to make sure that our people are 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 safe um, and as much as they can be in some of these places. So go ahead, Heather. So just to clarify, the monthly inspections that will be done can, are only exterior, they're not interior unless they're allowed in? Okay, okay. Because that, and if on a unit that were more than three and the fire inspector was in there. Now, if he were to see things that were not fire related, but were living conditions related, does that hold any onus? So um, Natalie's done a great job uh, of bringing together the team, I guess, who work mm -hmm. on, on site when the building inspector works on dangerous, the fire inspector obviously does fire inspection. Uh, I should let her speak to it, but uh, she she convenes them together to make sure that there's good communication, um, you know, between them uh, on issues of, of say jurisdiction. You know, that's his, not mine, and and kind of uh, uh, alerting them to, to a situation. So, uh, yeah, we we make sure that uh, if there's access and something is is seen, that it's that it's passed on. And and vacant buildings. I know that now in the new bylaw there has to be, they have to determine some plan and let us know what's going on with the building, but how long are we going to allow them to remain boarded up? Uh, I want to defer to Natalie on that because I'm not as uh, boned up on this sure bylaw. That, I don't know that we, <laughs> okay. Go ahead, Natalie. Did you hear that? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so I think I would like to make a motion that staff um, arrange a meeting with council to review the dangerous and unsightly file so that we know where we're actually stand. Yeah, after, after some time, like now or time, in time. In t well, in time, yes, yeah, so that we can get a picture of what is, go what is actually happening out there. Yeah. Right on. You know? Okay. Good. And, and, and the other. And it doesn't it could be just council members that are interested that, you know, in yeah. following up, but just so that we get a report that we know yeah. what's. Um, yeah, the other piece that we talked about is, uh, you know, what, as a council, what do we, is there anything we need to do as a council, like to either to hurt, I say hurry it up, but to make sure that it's taken care of, that all of our processes are in place? Like, how can we help staff? by, you know, do we need to implement any more bylaws? So for example, I'll just say what I, what I was 
I had said this to Jack, um, you know, if, if for example, under the unsightly, if you have to tell a landlord three or four weeks in a row to clean up your garbage, it, can we somehow find them? Like, can, can you, I hate to say that, but can you find them? Like, they need to be responsible for their properties. So stuff like that, that we could probably just, you know, have a chat about and see where we, where we stand. So anyway, so the motion is to, um, to have that team um, speak with council about that. Who seconded that? Deputy Mayor, any more discussion on this one? Okay, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Contrary? Motion carried. Thanks again, Natalie. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, um, was there anything in camera before we adjourn? Okay, all right. Um, so motion to adjourn. Okay, moved, seconded. Okay, all those, uh, second by Councillor Lesser. All those in favor? Aye. Contrary, motion carried. Um.